Okay, I think we'll get started. I know there will be a few more people walking in as we start, but um, in the interest of time, and uh, we always like to provide as much opportunity for discussion and questions. But just in case um, there are more questions than we can handle here, we also host lunch at the end of the presentation at the Ant Eater Instruction and Research Building, where Public Health is located. And you're welcome to join uh, the speaker at that forum, it's just at the lobby. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, really. My name is Dele Ogmusheta. I am a professor and chair of public health here at UC Irvine. Uh, we always thank the Office of Extension for helping us record this seminar series. Uh, it allows us to reach a broad audience. Uh, we sometimes get uh, inquiries about the speaker, the topic, long after the uh, actual presentation. We try best to moderate those and we won't send the speaker questions that we believe are misguided. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we also appreciate the contributions of our faculty and students for nominating speakers to this series. Uh, many, we've been doing this now for almost six years, and many of the uh, speakers from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, uh, had some kind of interaction with our faculty, our students, and sometimes staff. And in many cases, uh, they collaborate uh, with, with us on research um, and uh, we always encourage that uh, nomination. So please feel free to send me uh, nominations. We try to fill in the dates a, a year in advance. So right now we already have uh, nominees for the next academic year. Uh, even if you think you won't be around because you're graduating or you're not going to be in public health, uh, I think this enriches our campus and so we broadcast uh, through open course where, but we also invite people from our community and campus-wide to participate uh, in the seminar series. So today's speaker, I'm really delighted that we had the opportunity to bring uh, him in. And if there's always some discovery that happens. Uh, I think some of our masters in public health students uh, got in touch with him first. And then uh, after I met him, I realized that we had uh, very similar interests uh, on this topic. And uh, we've participated in, in the state's regulations in different formats. And, and so today's presentation for me uh, is a very special opportunity to listen to a perspective that I've, I'm sure I have not heard uh, since the last three or four years that I've been engaged with the California Safe Pro Consumer Product Regulation. So Dr. Dallas Cohen, uh, he, he's a toxicologist. Uh, he's board certified in industrial hygiene and he's a senior health scientist with Cardinal Chemist. Uh, his, his principal areas of training and expertise includes mental toxicology, neurotoxicology, biomarkers, physiology, industrial hygiene, and exposure and risk assessment. Uh, this dovetails with our new, uh, relatively new PhD in health, health science, environmental health sciences that we co-sponsor with uh, the School of Medicine. And uh, we, we really want to build that uh, PhD degree up. So if you're interested in these topics that he's an expert on, uh, please feel free to talk to him, talk to me, and hopefully we can bring him back occasionally to uh, either give a lecture, uh, collaborate in research with, with our faculty and students. Uh, he's provided uh, technical and mitigation support on various projects involving exposure and human health risk assessments. Note the word mitigation. That's almost always uh, the, the crowning um, uh, accomplishment in environmental health. And there have been many movies that I can list where uh, the public became aware of an environmental issue because of a lawsuit that became uh, national in, in scope, engaging many people from policymakers to lawyers to uh, 
expert witnesses uh, such as Dr. Cohen. Uh, he's worked with many compounds, benzene, styrene, vinyl fluoride, uh, manganese, asbestos, and um, his peer-reviewed publications have included a cross-sectional analysis of reported corporate environmental sustainability practices, and more recently, uh, he published a paper that uh, is uh, out in press, if you want a copy, we can send it to you, um, about the uh, evaluation of the California Safer Consumer Products Regulation and the impact on consumers and product manufacturers, which is the topic uh, of today's presentation. That paper was published in the journal Regulatory Toxicology and Pharmacology just at the uh, tail end of, of last year. Please join me to welcome Dr. Cohen to UC Irvine and to Public Health. Thank you. Thank you. Adele, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you all about um, an area of work that we think is, is emerging, it's growing. There's going to be a lot, of, you're gonna hear a lot about this on the news if you haven't already heard of it. How many of you have heard of the California Safer Consumer Products Regulation? Not many, okay. So um, this is a paper that I published earlier this year. Uh, it's the first peer reviewed manuscript on the topic. We took the whole, I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit, but. Um, we tried to analyze the most prevalently listed chemicals and how you go from a candidate, a candidate chemical to a chemical of concern to a product uh, priority product. Um, now, if you look at the original regulation, it's about 70. It's a 75-page legal document. It's very difficult to understand. There's a lot of. It's it's very detailed, but it's also very ambiguous. So we tried to put these in these regulations into table form uh, and to describe it for a small and medium-sized enterprise who may not have toxicologists on board or, or even, even internal attorneys or uh, national counsel. So this paper uh, published earlier this year, it also discusses some ideas of what the potential priority products may be that are identified by the DTSC. And I think a lot of us were very surprised at the first three that were announced uh, in March. And I'll talk a little bit about some that I think may happen uh, in the future. Just a brief introduction to what, a, or uh, outline of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'll walk you through how chemicals were identified, how they were prioritized, the history of uh, the Safer Consumer Products Regulation in California, the, how the, those first three priority products were identified, and then some technical strategies that I've uh, been proposing to companies in the area for dealing with this new regulation. When they, For instance, I just got a new project with a company that doesn't have a toxicologist on staff. They manufacture a, pro a product, but they don't really know what to do about this regulation, and I'm helping them with that. Then I'll talk about some case studies of both specific chemicals that are on these uh, on the prioritized list, as well as a, a case study of uh, it was kind of um, it came to us on a Friday. A manufacturer had a problem; they they needed a response by Monday, and a lot of times that's what happens. So we work over the weekend to try to solve their problem for them. Uh, Dale, I mentioned that I'm a consultant, and consultants, in my opinion, are, are the definition of consulting is you've got a certain background, education. Uh, an experience set and you solve the problems of your clients and they a lot of times their chemical exposure issues um, risk assessment they involve uh, using our background in toxicology industrial hygiene how many of you all have heard of toxicology a lot of you how about industrial hygiene yeah when I was in undergrad I had not heard the term industrial hygiene and it took until after um, I tried to look for a job with my undergrad that I was that I came across um, that field, and I'm going to talk. I might take a little bit of a break when I talk about risk assessment and give you a little bit of background on both industrial hygiene and toxicology, and then some key points and conclusions. So, as you all know, or as you might be able to guess, chemistry enables 95%, maybe even more, of the products that are on the marketplace today. Chemistry, whether it's you know, most people don't realize that even water is a, is a chemical. That there are more than 100,000. Some people even say a million discrete chemicals. That, that, are, that we're exposed to on a daily basis. And the fundamental of toxicology, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is identifying the dose at which an adverse health effect is elicited. So over the last 30 years, there's been various regulatory bodies, non-governmental organizations, um, even trade associations, associations that have developed lists. And we call those, we developed a list of lists, more than 50 different lists, which are that identify chemicals that are in products or in industrial settings, in occupational settings, in um, even environmental settings where exposure occurs. 
And again, regulatory agencies, trade organizations, NGOs, more than 50 less. One example is Prop 65. How many of you are old enough to drink? Okay, how many of you are old enough to, or have been to a bar? Okay, I didn't see any new questions, but any new students, but when you walk into a bar, you see a sign that says, chemicals at this premises are known to cause uh, either, are either carcinogens or are known to cause developmental toxicity. Has everybody seen those? Who knows what that chemical is in a bar? Ethanol, Ethanol alcohol, right. At some dose, at some dose, it, it will, is known to cause developmental toxicity, right. Um, how about you've been in Starbucks recently? Anybody know what that chemical is? Acrylamide, Acrylamide that's right. And it's, those are all, both of those chemicals are on these lists that are identified that at some dose, and again, that's the key issue. I, I think everybody in here probably had a cup of coffee this morning. Everybody's not worried. No one's worried about getting cancer from a single cup of coffee. That's an issue of dose, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But these lists obviously have severe impact on companies and supply chains and decision making because you cannot imagine, you can't underestimate the impact of public pressure when they hear that there's a carcinogen in a product. A lot of these lists just simply state that, that chemical is a carcinogen. It doesn't talk about the theory of dose and whether what dose it actually takes to um, cause cancer. How do you, how do you think those chemicals, um, how do you think they determine that those chemicals cause cancer? Anyone? A lot of times they do it through rodent studies. So they'll dose a rodent or some other animal model and they'll find cancer at some dose. And a lot of times those doses are much higher than you would anticipate in a consumer product setting or even in an industrial setting. It, it just is a, as a, in a, as a mechanistic approach for understanding the chemicals. So the DTSC, the California Department of Toxic Substances Control, um, their mission straight from the website to protect California's people from toxic substances in the environment and to regulate and to prevent pollution. All right, they've been enabled by, or the California Consumer Products Regulation um, is a part of the DTSC. The DTSC enforces that regulation. I'm gonna talk about the history of over the last 30 years, how the, how the SCP came to be, but this is really a landmark regulation. A lot of people even say that California is not allowed to even implement this regulation because, that, because uh, it's against state rights to deal with trade, international trade, to impose sanctions on international trade. So that, that's something that maybe may or may not be litigated in the future. Um, but this regulation really puts the impetus on the manufacturer for understanding the chemicals used in their supply chain, all the way back up the supply chain, all the way through the end of life. Understand the health effects of the chemicals, uh, and uh, as well as the, all, the adverse health effects throughout the life cycle, both in manufacturing, consumer product setting, and in the end of life. And again, uh, Cal how, California is two, makes up 2% of the world domestic product. So that California is not a small marketplace. Can you imagine someone wanting to sell a different product in California than they sell throughout the United States or internationally? Likely not. They're going to want to have one product that they ship throughout the United States. So this has implications both uh, within the United States, within each state, and internationally. So this is a little diagram that shows you the last 30 years in California, some key events that led to the uh, enactment of the Safer Consumer Product Regulation on October 1st, 2013. The DTSC was established in 1972 by Pete Wilson, and I was actually giving a talk at a law firm a few months ago, and Pete Wilson ended up being a principal for that law firm, and he was sitting in the back, and I saw him, I saw him reading my paper, and I didn't realize that he was in the room until he stood up and said his name. But, so he uh, established the DTSC. Most of you probably heard of the of TOSCA, or the U.S. Toxic Substances Control Act, which has implications for products and chemicals in products throughout the United States. Again, uh, the Safe Water and Toxic Enforcement Act of 1986, we talked about that. That's better known as Prop 65. Over the next 30 years, there's been several other. Uh, Massachusetts has a Toxic Use and Reduction Act. Um, you see REACH, or the um, Registration, Evaluation, and Authorization of Chemicals. That takes that's in the EU. That uh, was enacted in 2008. And then the same year, um, at the time, it was, it was Governor Schwarzenegger who brought about the California Green Chemistry Initiative. And through, over the past four years, they got to this point in 2012 and 2013 where they established this regulation. In 2012, there was a memo of understanding between the US EPA and the DTSC, and they began to draft this SCP regulation. The first draft was about a year ago. 
there was, as you can imagine, there was a whole year worth of public comments, both from, again, those NGOs, from individual citizens, from uh, industry. Uh, they, then finally, in, 2000, or in October 1st, 2013, they signed it into, into law, and they had up until April 1st to identify their first priority products. And they could identify up to five priority products, but in, on March, in March they announced three, and we'll talk about each of those in detail. So this is straight from the DTSC website. This is a flow diagram of the entire regulation. So you guys can read that and I don't have to talk anymore, right? Well, that, that's very, this, is, this is very convoluted. There's ins and outs. And here you see announced in March is the priority products. And this is all the things that are going to happen after that over the next year. There's strict deadlines for responding to the DTSC if you're a company that makes a priority product. But I just wanted to show you this so that you can understand how difficult it is to understand this new landscape if you're a smaller company that doesn't have the, uh, the horsepower to, to follow up on all of these requirements of the regulation. So we talked a lot about chemicals so far. What are the candidate chemicals and how are they identified and how are they prioritized? So a couple definitions. You can read that on your own. This is a definition of a chemical. One thing you'll notice is not the standard definition of a chemical. It includes things like ions, metabolites, uncombined ions or uncombined radicals. Uh, there's, there are things on the lists like uh, an occupation working with Coke ovens, Chinese salted fish, gasoline. These are all things that are candidate chemicals that could be identified. Now, they've prioritized it since their initial list of 2,900 chemicals. But this is a very broad definition of a chemical, and in fact, it includes things like mixtures, which have constituent chemicals. And, and I'll, I'll add that not a lot is known about mixtures in the environmental health sciences and toxicology. We're, we're very, uh, it's a very new subject, understanding both exposure and you know, how chemicals interact biologically. So that's something to keep your eye on. So a candidate chemical is a chemical that they've identified as being listed on one of those I'm going to talk about the, tw the 23 authoritative lists. But a candidate chemical, something that's designated, that is a candidate for designation as a chemical of concern. What's a chemical of concern? A chemical of concern is a chemical that has been linked to a product to create a product chemical combination that then becomes a priority product identified by the DTSC. And I'm going to show you three in just a moment that were identified in March. So this is a, just a more basic flow chart of how the SCP works. They have the chemicals. Those are on candidate chemical lists, which are the authoritative lists. They link the chemical with the product to come up with a priority product. And then there are six potential responses that any manufacturer or responsible entity, we'll talk about the difference between a, manu, a manufacturer and a responsible entity in a minute, but there are six potential responses. One of them is called an alternative analysis, and that has several steps. It's in, 12 to 18 month process, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Then after you've, conduct, you've responded to the DTSC, then there are several re regulatory responses that the DTSC imposes. So I mentioned in my paper, I mentioned to you that I, made, I wrote a paper. So what I did was I took all of the authoritative lists that were identified by the DTSC and put them in, in a database. We determined that there were 2,900 discrete chemicals. So you see here's the, this is in the regulation, the subsection. You've got the candidate chemical list. We talked about Prop 65. You've got the CLP in the European Union, which identifies endocrine disruptors, respiratory sensitizers, category 1A, 1B, carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxicants. The, across the board, these are all chemicals that they're concerned about. Uh, you've got IRIS, which is the information risk information system, or integrated risk. Uh, that identifies neurotoxicants, carcinogens, You've got a Canadian list here, which is PBT. Anybody know what PBT is? Persistent, bioaccumulative, and highly toxic. Those are, now they've got 393 chemicals on that list. Again, up here you've got 1,100. Some of them are overlapping, which is why you can't sum that column, but 2,900 discrete chemicals. So these are chemicals that where there is an identification of a hazard. There's 15 lists. On the next set of lists, these are candidate chemical types, meaning in California they've got biomonitoring data indicating that there is potential exposure to these chemicals in, in, in the biosphere. So again, here you've got the subsection, the chemical types, uh, the location, the number, um, and then again, these go all the way, this one, uh, let's see, US EPA, California Water um, and Clean Water Act hasn't been updated since 1981, but these are the, the 23 discrete lists. 
Now, if you put those all into a, into a database and rank them by the number of times that they were listed, you, this is the top 40 most pre prevalent chemicals. At the top, you'll see lead. Lead was identified in 63 of those 23 lists. It goes all the way from cadmium, beryllium, chloroform, acrylonitrile, uh, naphthalene, hydrazine, ethylbenzene. Uh, I've got some highlighted here. Now, these are chemicals that we don't anticipate to be used in products manufacturing, right? Asbestos is not used, it's not banned, but it's not used in most, uh, for most applications anymore, at least since it started to be phased out in 1985. So I've highlighted these because I wanted to move those out of the list and come up with the 40 most prevalent chemicals that are not banned so we can increase the number. So one, one I want point to point out here is vinyl chloride. Vinyl chloride, uh, Dow made approximately 100 billion tons of vinyl chloride uh, in the past year. So while it's not in most consumer products, and we would, we would believe that it's probably not going to be a priority product, we wanted to leave it in. You'll see it, I've left vinyl chloride here. Um, vinyl chloride is associated with both acroosteolysis, which is a bony stub when you have acute, highly, it's a, it's a very toxic chemical. When you, and 30 years ago, before they had personal protective equipment, and they, and they under, before OSHA, they didn't understand the, the hazards of this chemical, and they had workers go into vats and scrape it without any PPE. And they developed like bony fissures on their hands, and it's also associated with a signal tumor. You've got, anybody know what a signal tumor is? So a signal tumor is you've got a chemical and you've got a disease. And most people believe that if you've got this disease, you were probably exposed to this chemical. Asbestos and mesothelioma is one of those. Um, AML or acute myelogenous leukemia is associated with benzene. And uh, vinyl chloride is associated with hepatic angiosarcoma. Those are, those are um, signal tumors. So I've left vinyl chloride in there even though I don't believe that it's gonna be a priority product in the near future, but I wanted to leave it in there because it's manufactured on such a high scale. Um, you've got other chemicals in here like cobalt. Now cobalt is, um, maybe you have all been following the, the metal hip litigation where you've got the de wear debris in the hip and that they're worried about both systemic and local cobalt exposure. However, cobalt is a naturally occurring element. It's an essential element and it's many people, some people even take it as a supplement. So you have to put this in terms of exposure and what, how much it takes to really cause an adverse health effect. And that's something I'm gonna talk about in terms of a full-on product risk assessment. All right, so I mentioned you've got all these lists that they, that they pulled these 2,900 chemicals, net, the next, that's 29. And the next step is to prioritize those chemicals into a smaller list so that you, get, so that you can effectively manage that. Um, again, this is a, a Venn diagram straight from the DTSC website. You've got the hazard traits. This is the 15 that I showed you before. And over here are the exposure indicators. Those are the eight lists that I showed you here. From those 2,900, they narrowed it down to about 1,060 individual chemicals. And then uh, they focused it again to get to 153 chemicals. Mo the priority products that will be chosen over the next three years will be come from this list of 153. Easy to download from the DTSC website. You pull it, you can see what lists they came from. Um, but these are the 153 chemicals they feel pose the greatest risk to Californians in consumer product settings. All right, so that's how they got to the candidate chemicals. The next step is identifying a pri how do you come up with a priority product? So you've got candidate chemicals. The DTSC is going to prioritize candidate chemicals and move them to a product chemical combination um, to come up with your priority products. And once it's Associate, once a chemi candidate chemical is associated with a priority product, it then becomes a chemical of concern. So these are the three that were announced in March. Most, my, my conversations with the DTSC as well as other people in the marketplace really believe that, over the, I showed you that timeline, over the last four years they've been working really hard on this. Some people have, there's been a lot of uh, negative press, there's been a lot of positive press, but what's, what is undisputed is they needed a home run to show that this regulation uh, was a hit. So they chose these three chemicals, um, they had a webinar, uh, they talked about each of the individual chemicals and what the exposures were associated with the chemicals. The first one is chlorinated tris in children's foam sleeping articles. So you notice you've got a chemical, which is now a chem chemical of concern associated with a specific product. Now they didn't say um, in mattresses or furniture because flame retards are, are strictly, strictly regulated by the Technical Bulletin 117 in California. So they're specifically looking at, now if you've got, 
uh, chlorinated tris in a seat cushion, it's not regulated by this. You're probably not going to have a seat cushion become a priority product. But what's interesting about this is over the past three years, there's been a lot of literature published about chlorinated tris, and most manufacturers are moving away from that already. So we're going to talk about the responses and the different ways manufacturers can respond to this, but most people believe that it won't go down that path. They'll just stop making that product with that chemical or they'll use an alternative. Um, the next one is unreacted diisocyanates or TDI. There's also MDI. If you've ever seen somebody try to seal uh, in your garage, it has two canisters that come together. Toluene diisocyanate expands polyurethane and it becomes a foam. So if the chemistry or if the two chemicals don't go together perfectly and there's, it's not all consumed, you can have unreacted diisocyanates, which um, can cause health effects, especially in an acute setting. So, um, however, most, most people that use this are in an occupational setting, not a consumer product setting. So there is some speculation that, you know, are they really allowed to name this? Because this is specifically for consumer products among the general population, not in industrial settings where you've got um, people who are probably using PPE. I, when you apply this, I'm pretty sure on the MSDS is going to tell you to wear a half mask respirator at the very minimum, maybe a, a full mask respirator. So if you've got a respirator and you've got an assigned protection factor on that respirator of 50, your exposure is actually 50 times less than what's already there and it's a little bit different than you might have in a consumer product setting where you don't have a health and safety professional helping you to um, prevent those exposures. And then the last one is uh, varnish removers, industrial paint strippers, and surface cleaners with methylene chloride. Now that, that chemical is associated with develop, once you're exposed to that, you can have high concentrations of carbon monoxide and, and you know, everyone knows what happens when you have too much carbon monoxide. It can be a chemical asphyxi asphyxiant. Um, so all of the, these last two, there are some, you see industrial strength, there's a question whether that is actually a, not, a, a consumer product setting or whether it's an industrial setting. Um, but what's true about all three is they can all be made without that chemical. And if it's really a chemical of concern, it, is it really necessary is the question that the DTSC is asking. I was very surprised by this, although um, the more I think about it, uh, they, well, one, they needed a home run, but two, I expected to see a product, that, a Walgreens product, I've been calling it, where you could go into Walgreens and buy it. Phthalates and nail polish, phthalates in, a, in a, um, a rain jacket, a child's rain jacket. I thought we might see 1,4 dioxane in surface cleaner. Um, but in October, they're going to announce their, oh, so take a step back. So when they gave their talk, these are the, the markers where they said they were going to help pick the priority products, how they were going to prioritize the selection. The ones in red are the ones they specifically said uh, or mentioned, and that's potential for significant human environmental adverse impact, impacts, impact on sensitive subpopulations, children, elderly, you mentioned the, we mentioned the children's sleeping pad, and clear exposure from the product. Now, this is interesting because I'll go back a slide. The industry or the SP, SPF industry has a lot of data. They haven't published it in the peer review literature, but they have a lot of data that within two seconds after that reaction, there's no unreacted diisocyanates. However, they didn't get ahead of the curve and publish that in the literature. So that's one area we're trying to get to manufacturers now to say, let us do a product risk assessment. Let us evaluate the exposure. Let us publish in the peer review literature our findings, and you may be able to modify the regulatory landscape going forward. Or at least, at the very least, you don't wake up one morning like the F SPF industry and realize you've got a uh-oh moment and you don't know, you have to run scrambling and deal with the timelines that the DTSC has, about, has established in their regulation. All right, so on October 1st, they're gonna identify eight to 15 more priority products. So there's a very short window over the next six months to, for, for manufacturers to prepare for anybody who wants to follow up on this to prepare. So eight to 15 more priority products potentially could be announced on the 1st. Um, and what's interesting is we had those 2,900 that went down to 153. If someone really believes that a chemical was left off, they can associate themselves with a congressman and get it added. Or in October, if someone says, I really think that phthalates and nail polish is a public health concern, I want to nominate that to be a priority product. They can, there's ways for them to do that as well. So you've received a priority product notification. Let's say you manufacture, uh, you manufacture a children's foam sleeping pad and it's got Tris in it. What do you do? Um, your first step is you can hear this six different res potential responses that are allowed. Remove that priority product from commerce. You've got 180 days to tell the DTSC that you're going to just take the product, you're going to step out of the marketplace, you're going to stop selling it. 
the next one is to remove the chemical from the product without an alternative. So you can just say, I'm going to continue to make the product. I'm going to use a different chemical without an alternative. The next one is a product chemical replacement. You're going to take that product off the market, reformulate it, send it back out into the market. But you're not leaving it in the market to be sold. The next one is a threshold analysis. Um, now, this is for a chemical that is not an, an ingredient. You may have something called ethoxylated alcohols, which is in your product. Um, a lot of spray cleaners have that that you'd find right off the store, uh, in the store. Um, now, there's a, a, it's an unintended byproduct of that chemistry. You get dioxane, which is a group 2B carcinogen, but it takes a very high dose in order to cause an adverse health effect. You may actually, actually if there's enough sulfur in the, in the reagent, you may even get formaldehyde. Again, both of those are candidate chemicals but they're unintended byproducts and they would expect it, we would expect them to be very small and at a trace level. So you can do a threshold analysis, and I'll talk about that in a, a little bit more in a minute, that is you say, listen, the chemical is in the product, but it's a very low dose and it's below the PQL or limited detection or however you want to deal with that with the DTSC. And then the final step, which there's been a lot of talk about alternative assessments or alternative analysis, there's a two-step two process where you identify the, I'll talk about it in a minute, but you identify the function of the chemical, potential alternatives, and then you go through a year-long process to exchange one chemical for the other that has, uh, if you essentially has less uh, public health hazard. So who's responsible for this? You've got this regulation. You've got people who sell the product, people who assemble products, people who are manufacturers. The, the main impetus of, the, of this regulation goes on the manufacturer. However, throughout the regulation, they call on responsible entities to take control. You can imagine if you've got a product, you're a retailer and you, your supply chain goes internationally and you're not sure that they're gonna take care of this, you could say, listen, this product is so important to my business model that I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna put pressure on upstream manufacturers, importers, um, to, to take control of this and identify these chemicals and go through the regulatory process. Again, manufacturer is the first line of defense, but everybody else is also going to be held accountable should the manufacturer decide they don't want to be accountable. And again, it's any product sold, offered, supplied, distributed, or manufactured in California. All right, so let's talk about some technical strategies and, and risk assessment and industrial, how we can put the, put, the, put the science to work. I mentioned all of those initial authoritative lists, the 50 of them just identified the chemical. The SCP is specifically designed to match exposure with hazard and not just the presence of the chemical. So this is how they prioritize from 100,000 100, to 1,200 um, products with, with candidate chemicals. And this, so this is a prioritization. Manufacturers and, and consumers as well need to also do a prioritization or a business decision to make sure, do you want to buy the product? Do you want to manufacture the product? This is all about a prioritization. So Chemrisk, uh, my, the firm that I work for, we, we have an office in Orange County. We've done f more than 500 risk assessments and uh, you know, a lot of the risk assessments we've done have been more reactive. Someone has been sued for an exposure and they have a disease endpoint and we would go back and identify where the exposures took place and which exposures led to that disease endpoint. That's very reactive. What we're trying to suggest here is that you be proactive and, uh, and do a product risk assessment on the front end. Um, we've got a lot of experience with Prop 65, but what I really wanted to show you is this, this process. This is not a process that we established. This was developed in 1983 by the National Research Council. It's called a Human Health Risk Assessment, and it's got four steps. Um, first step is hazard identification, which is where you identify, what, and really the DTSC has already done the hazard, hazard ID step. They've said this is the hazard, and here are the physical chemical properties, and here's why uh, it's a, potentially a candidate chemical. Then you've got a dose response, and that's toxicologists identify a, a dose at which adverse health effects are found, or a threshold that can be used, animal models, uh, you know, a lot of times you, you, we, it's unethical to use a human model today, but back 30 years ago, you, I observed this in the workplace, like I mentioned with vinyl chloride, um, but typically this is a laboratory assessment of a threshold. And then you do an exposure assessment. So you might say that these, the toxicologists are over here, the industrial hygienists are here, uh, the exposure assessment is identifying the exposure, but airborne, dermal, hand-to-mouth, accidental ingestion, identifying at what level is the organism exposed. And then the risk characterization brings it all together and identifies what's, what's the risk at a given dose. So this, that threshold analysis I mentioned, uh, this is uh, a standard curve. It's called a sigmoid dose response curve. 
at some level you're going to have no effect or there is some concentration at which you will not see an adverse health effect. You could probably see that in aspirin as a good example. Uh, anything, anything has an example of a dose response curve, but if you have half an aspirin, you may not see any effect. At two aspirin, you would have a therapeutic effect. Maybe one aspirin, you have long-term cardiovascular health benefits of having an aspirin. You go to like 10, 20, 30, you're going to start to have nausea, vomiting, and at maybe 50 aspirin, you're going to have death. So there are, every chemical has a sigmoid curve or some shaped curve. Um, there is a dose below which you would not see an adverse health effect. There's a dose above which you would see different grades of adverse health effects. So the DTSC allows you to do a uh, product risk assessment, identify that the chemical is in the product, but it's below that threshold that was identified. Um, so they allow you to conduct a product risk assessment. They, they identify several ways for determining thresholds, the practical quantitation limit, and that's, that's kind of a squishy term. It's, there's a lot of differentiation between labs. A lot of times it's you're hindered by your technology, so a PQL could come down as technology advances. Um, there are safe harbor levels specifically within Prop 65, so manufacturers have to adhere to a uh, Prop 65, either an MDL, uh, so, so it's maximum uh, allowable dose, an MADL, those are concentrations below which you would not see either carcinogenic effects or developmental tox toxic effects. Or you could develop another threshold, that's, that's for another day to talk about how those thresholds will be developed. Um, I mentioned the last phase is the alternative analysis or one of the possible responses. This process could last up to 18 months, it could be even longer depending on how back and forth the manufacturer goes with the DTSC. But this first phase it takes about 180 days or you're allowed 180 days. That's where you're identifying the purpose of the chemical in the product. You're identifying additional uh, alternatives that could be used. Now you don't want to just, now some of the problems with old lists is that people would just pick a chemical that's not listed, right? Doesn't mean that we know that it's safer, it just isn't listed, it hasn't been identified. So you have to pick a chemical that does the same thing in the product, but at the same time doesn't have those negative health effects. So the first phase is pretty much qualitative. You present a, how you, a proposal to the DTSE, how you're gonna fix the problem. The next phase, which can take up to a year if there's no back and forth, but it may go longer than that, is more of a qualitative phase where you're um, developing a consensus with the DTSC between the, chem the candidate chemical and the alternative. You're using laboratory analytical tools that will vary depending on what the chemical constituent is. Um, does, it do does it have the same function as the original chemical? Is it economically feasible to use that alternative? And then um, you'll go from there and the DTSC will tell you if you've done a good job or not. Now, uh, all of these documents that you submit to the DTSC are all public record. They'll all be pub posted on uh, the DTSC website, you can imagine how uh, troubling that could be for a manufacturer who has like, nobody still, people still don't know it's in Coca-Cola, it's a proprietary formula, right? So you're gonna let DTSC post everything on, the, on, on their website. That's, manufacturers are worried about that. Um, so, and a lot of times when we're in litigation, a case turns into what you knew and when. This provides a roadmap for um, bounty hunters to go after product manufacturers and sue them on a what you knew and when claim. Um, so again, we're, alternative analysis could happen. I mentioned the children's foam sleeping pads. I don't think anybody's ever gonna do an alternative analysis on that. They're gonna take it from the market and stop using that chemistry. And that, according to the DTSC, is a win, right? Because they've, they've enabled change through the regulation. Whether you go through the whole rulemaking or not, they've made change. This could be a multi-year process and it potentially lays the groundwork for future litigation. On the other end, if you do a threshold analysis, less costly, less involved, you're not submitting documents to the DTSE that can be used against you by plaintiff's lawyers. Um, and it allows you to say, here's my product, here's the concentration in my product, and it's below regulatory guidelines, those established by Cal EPA. So again, I didn't develop this. Chemers didn't develop this. This is a, a standardized product developed by the um, by, by the United States government. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about risk assessment. This is not, this is just a side, so you guys can get a little information about what I do and what Chemris does, but this is a multi-stage process. Risk assessment uses many different disciplines, pharmacokinetics. I'm a toxicologist and an industrial hygienist. There, that's linked to epidemiology, exposure assessment, physical chemical or chem, uh, um, chemistry over here, exposure simulation, pathology, these are all intertwined disciplines within risk assessment. Um, 
toxicology. This guy over here is Paracelsus. He's the father of risk assessment. Uh, you'll notice he hasn't been around for a while, but these theories that he developed 500 years ago are still used today. It's in the first chapter of every toxicology book. Um, the study of poisons is toxicology. And Paracelsus, what is that, 600 years ago, said that all things are poison, for there is nothing without poisonous qualities. It is only the dose which makes the poison. And that's, um, again, first chapter, first class in any toxicology class. Industrial hygiene. Um, now my first exam in, ma in my master's degree in industrial hygiene, this was the answer to the question, what is industrial hygiene? And it's AREC. Anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control of chemical, physical, and biological agents in the workplace. That's what we do. We try to protect people from having adverse health effects or being exposed in the workplace. Anticipation is working with engineers to try to identify what chemicals may be associated with what project, product or what uh, industrial application. And then you try to recognize them by doing industrial hygiene sampling or taking air monitoring or doing wipe samples or some other scientific approach for identifying exposure. Uh, and that also is evaluation. And then control. There's the hierarchy of controls. The first thing you should try to do is isolate the, the exposure. Then there's to use um, engineering controls, which is like ventilation or um, mostly, ven mostly ventilation. Uh, and then the final one is PPE, which is using personal protective equipment, which should only be used after all of the uh, other options have been uh, extinguished. But you're talking about hearing protection, respirators. And each one of those areas is, is classes and classes and has a lot, it's very involved. But here this is Ramaz Bernardo Ramazzini. Most people think of him as the father of industrial hygiene. Uh, and he published this book, De Morbus Artificum De Atrib which outlined the health hazards of various different, dif different toxicants in 52 different occupations. And again, that's just after Paracelsus. Uh, and not the father of industrial hygiene, but another very uh, famous figure in industrial hygiene. And he was one of the first to identify a specific exposure with a specific disease endpoint. And he identified that there was an association between chimney sweeps and having the occupation of a chimney sweep going up into chimneys and, and the being exposed to soot. And there was a high incidence and prevalence of um, scrotal cancer among that occupation. So that's just a little side note on industrial hygiene and toxicology. So risk, you got the risk assessment process. You identify the hazard. You de determine the dose response or the threshold. Do an exposure assessment. All of that lead to the risk characterization, which is at what dose are you expected to see um, an adverse health effect. And again, there's a source for the, from the National Academy of Sciences. So some case studies. We've got about 12 minutes left, then I'll give you guys time, plenty of time to answer questions. Um, you saw lead was number one, the top of the list, the most prevalent chemical. Using the electronics industry, and this is a case of what, where there was an, a replacement of a different chemical with a different chemical where we knew less about it. So in 2000, they phased out lead from in lead solders. They instituted bismuth and tin. It's not lead, it's not listed, but we knew even less about tin and bismuth than we did about uh, lead. So this is why you want to develop the life cycle management before you make a substitution. Dioxane, I mean, this is, this is going to be huge over the next six months. I'm working with com companies that have dioxane in their product, um, but it's at such a low level that it wouldn't produce a public health concern. It's a group two, and all of those um, first priority products were all the group 2B or less. So we're not talking about group one where we know that these are carcinogens you want to keep them out of products, but they're possibly human carcinogens. Um, again, it's not intentionally added. And I'll talk a little bit more about this with Johnson & Johnson in a minute. Triclosan, you probably, I bet half of you may, might have this in your bag. This has a chemical called triclosan. Um, it's used in hand sanitizer, soap. Uh, it has the potential to produce chloroform and dioxin under the right uh, situations. Um, it's so prevalent in society that that's why they have it on the list, that there's so many different opportunities for exposure. But it's still unclear whether the concentration that you would see in a consumer product setting would be enough to cause an adverse health effect. BPA, and I'm going to save this for later because I'm going to talk about BPA, but this was banned in baby bottles. I'm sure you've all heard of BPA. There was a, um, uh, let, me, let me save that. I've got another something on that. So phthalates, I mentioned phthalates and nail polish. It's a plasticizer, makes plastic, or specifically PVC, more pliable. Um, Greenpeace found phthalates in uh, children's toys. 
but it's pretty clear that the concentr now you can imagine if you've got that ball right there and it has phthalates and it's inside of it, unless you're grinding it up or chewing it or licking it, you're probably not gonna have any exposure. And then if you do have exposure, uh, what's the level? And we're, we're conducting risk assessments on this right now, especially since you have a sensitive subpopulation. So this is a case study that I thought you might find it interesting to see a real life um, case study. We, had, we were asked to do a risk assessment again on a Friday. They had a, we, had, we do a lot of um, these types of projects. So this is DEHP, or it's a phthalate and formaldehyde. You see this? So they had probably had 10 million of these onesies. I have, a, I have an 18 month old daughter, so I know a lot about onesies these days, but they had a claim that there was, on the back of the neck, there was a dermatitis on the back of the child's neck. And they were worried that, so you've got this inkless or tagless printing. These two chemicals are used to adhere the ink to the back of the onesie. So there was a health claim that this arose from those chemicals in the process. So that's part of the hazard ID and understanding how the chemicals, how you could potentially have exposure. So we, what we do, we conducted a product risk assessment. We interviewed the manufacturers, the engineers, um, and tried to understand where these exposures would come from and what level would they be. Um, we determined that formaldehyde and DHP were detected, were not high enough to cause dermatitis. They were in fact within the parameters of ambient concentrations of those same chemicals. Um, we compared our exposure assessment with those Prop 65 safe harbor levels. So we knew that there wasn't a requirement to warn under Prop 65. Um, and it was below the allowable dose levels or the MADL. Um, and since there was like, I think there was a 300 people out of the 100 million onesies that had that reaction, um, their class was denied certification as a class action lawsuit. And what we actually proposed or determined was if you ever put a piece of duct tape on your hand, you'd imagine it would get irritated. It occludes the skin and prevents evaporation of liquid and it gets irritated. That, that's one possible way that that, that, that fresh against the skin, that tagless uh, tag or that inkless tag uh, prevented water from evaporating from that area. It was also raised quite a bit. We took a look at a lot of them and set, sometimes the ink was raised. So that could have just been an abrasion uh, or rubbing of the skin causing that irritation. But based on our analysis, it definitely wasn't from exposure to those two chemicals. So key points, um, this, is a, this is from January, Johnson & Johnson. This is the, the head uh, toxicologist for Johnson & Johnson. They wanted to re remove 1,4-dioxin and formaldehyde from their No More Tears shampoo. Um, she said in the last sentence of the article that it was the most difficult thing she's ever done at Johnson & Johnson. She went through 25 potential replacement ingredients. None of them had the same, if you remove the, the ethoxylated alcohols, you don't have the same smell, you don't have the same fragrance, it doesn't appear the same. Sometimes there was debris in the, in the product, um, but it took more, almost 20 different versions of the product until they could remove this. My point here is that Reformulation takes time. The DTSC allows 90 days or sometimes 180 days to reformulate a product. R&D processes can take up to eight years to actually remove or to modify a formulation. So it really does take time. I mentioned I was gonna talk again about BPA. So BPA was banned in specific products like baby bottles. You heard this in the news. It's been controversial for the past 20 years. Um, this is a paper from the FDA about two months ago that says at concentrations, that are typically experienced in consumer product settings, exposure to BPA is not a health hazard. Most, and in fact, some of these other not BPA um, chemicals that are used can have even higher estrogenic activity than BPA itself. So this is an example of you cannot underestimate the power of public pressure and really need to get ahead of the science. It's been banned, but it's potentially not, not really a concern. Um, so preparing for the next priority products, well, we're suggesting that you conduct product risk assessments using the methodologies we've discussed, um, publish those in the peer review literature, and understand your product, the companies need to understand their product life cycle. And that's one, if, if this regulation does one thing, it's gonna force manufacturers to understand the chemicals used in their life cycles. So know what chemistries are in the product. Um, you don't want a notification and then have that be the first day of your analysis. Um, there are other options other than an alternative analysis. We talked about those, um, but those options take time. So um, with that, uh, I appreciate all of your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, we do have time for questions. Sure. Okay, I'll ask the question. Okay. Uh, so, I was surprised that uh, in, I think it's like 16 or 17, 
Mercury was not, uh, I guess, banned, or it was banned, so you didn't put it in the second slide. And I uh, was surprised that Mercury was exempt from the SEPA So it's here on the five, yep. and it's not in the next one. Right. right. So we removed it because we didn't anticipate that that would be a chemical used in consumer products widely. Right, except that in the lower it was exempted right. in forest and five. For so what? Forest and two. Forest and right, five. Right, right, right. And so, so it is used. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people thought that it should have been put into mm -hmm. sport manufacturers of forest and five. So I don't I don't know that it's used in other mm -hmm. other consumer products, but I suspect it be maybe even in some thermostats. Mm -hmm. So it's it's curious that it sure. has a reputation of not being used anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, if it's in that thermostat, it would be very difficult to be exposed to it unless you chew it up. So it's, it's also the opportunity for exposure that's, that's a concern. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, so there seems to be this process where companies make uh, products with new chemicals in it, and then they're later found to be um, hazardous to health, and then it's withdrawn or modified. Is there a way? for the research on chemicals to come before the production of these um, of these, you know, products and then it's introduced to the market? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, I don't know that there's an answer. I think that that would be ideal, but if you look at the, I did these by cast numbers, there's more than 81 million different cast numbers and it's estimated that an additional 15,000 cast numbers are introduced every day. So a lot of this is that we're limited by technology. Certainly if you're a product manufacturer and you're going to use a new chemical, you would want to do enough research and development to understand the, those chemistries and what types of hazards would occur if you had exposure to those chemistry, chemicals. Um, now if you think of a company like Procter & Gamble that's you know, $20 billion, they make $20 billion a year, they have chemists that can do that and hopefully they're going through those processes, but smaller companies maybe don't have that type of horsepower and they look at this list and they say maybe those are the only ones I need to be concerned about, not the new ones that we're generating. Um, so you pick a chemical that's not listed. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at. A lot of this is, this does provide an opportunity to be um, proactive rather than just reactive. Uh, I think a lot of, you know, you call it uh, regulation by litigation sometimes. You don't really want to do anything about it until somebody put your thumb on you and I think this provides a regulatory, this regulation provides a regulatory driver to force comp manufacturers into um, being more responsible for the chemicals in their product. That was a good question, thank you. Yeah? Um, so when I was looking through the list, there's a lot of them that are chemical alternative or chemical intermediates mm -hmm. um, within our process, so how, um, with how uh, the product is defined in the regulations, do processes count as a priority product? So I think they're more concerned with the end product and the exposure to an end user of a product. Certainly if you use a chemical in a product manufacturing process and then that chemical is not completely consumed or remains in the final product, that's a problem and that's going to be part of, that's going to be associated with this. Now, it, you, let's see, what's a good example? Um, you're talking about, a, like you, so ethoxylated alcohols is a good example. You use ethylene oxide to make, to make ethylene ethoxylated alcohols, that chemical should be completely consumed in the initial reaction and won't be in the final product, but you don't know until you test it. So if that chemical is in the final product, then it, then absolutely it would be. One more question mm -hmm. about uh, one of the three priorities. Sure. Diacetylphyronics. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and I don't know the chemistry, but I, I remember that it has a uh, a particular place in the public imagination because of the Bhopal accident sure. and what was credited for that disaster was the science mm -hmm. and, I, and what you said about, okay, so it's occupational setting, but after the product is 
play. Under some conditions, you, can you get the, the release of this of the and My understanding is that it, it, it would not, unless you, I mean, I'm sure, I, I haven't really studied it too much, but you've got the two chemicals that go together and then it expands the polyurethane. So you'd have to undo that reaction in order for them to be, in order for there to be residual diisocyanates. My understanding is it's completely bound or encapsulated in that final product. Um, perhaps if you burned it or did something else, but through the normal use of the product, my understanding is that those TDIs are completely consumed and not left, not unreacted at, within a couple minutes after the reaction. You shook your head. Do you think they are? So you're talking about the specific products that are, that are targeted, correct? Yes. Um, it, so it, how much of the decision was driven by uh, the manufacturing itself? That is, so what happened in Bhopal was a, a factory that makes it, yes, in the middle of a popular area. Um, it, do you get a sense that ETS is also trying to get manufacturers, even if the chemical doesn't end up in the product, mm -hmm. that you know we still have to make it, people right. are still Sure. So my point on, on your question, the, so the question is, do they have any jurisdiction in an occupational setting? And my understanding is that they don't because, uh, as you all know, OSHA, or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, has jurisdiction over the workplace. Uh, in their talk on that webinar they gave, they were very happy with what they had done and they talked a lot about occupational settings. So it will remain to be seen whether they have any impact there. but. The, 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 reg the regulation talks about the life cycle up the supply chain through end of life. The manufacturing process is part of the life cycle, but that's definitely an OSHA concern and not a DTSC concern. You know, they're going to try to initiate um, change in that area, but we'll see what happens. Yeah? So just to clarify, you said it's a sample and that's, 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 that's what the FDA said. You have, to t you have to put this in context of dose because they found that BPA had estrogenic activity in a laboratory animal. They also knew that that chemical was used as an agent in baby bottles and you've got a sensitive subpopulation and so the precautionary principle states that you have to remove that chemical because you have a sensitive subpopulation regardless of dose. Um, if you look at a lot of the health claims, they're, they're, very, they're, they're across the board for BPA. Um, have they ever, has anyone ever done a wide-scale epidemiological study to determine whether exposure to BPA from baby bottles caused any adverse health effect? Hasn't been done. Um, according to the new FDA paper, the concentrations from, that you would experience in a consumer product setting, probably not an issue, but the United States and the EU uh, are on board with, with that fact. Probably one troubling thing with the BPA story is, is that the alternative that's been Mm -hmm. BPA sure. It's yeah. even more estrogenic. Yeah. So the, like Tristan or Triton, I don't know, mm -hmm. it has the same. Yeah. But, but it's not listed. Yeah, Nobody ever good. identified it, but they use something else because so that that goes back to the original question of just choosing an alternative. And this this uh, regulation has several steps where you prove that that chemical is not more harmful than the chemical you, you originally used. Well, I, I think there's a lot of gray area on what the DTSC thinks they cover. I think OSHA pretty much, they know where their area is. Um, they're enacting change in both places is, what, is the way they see it, I think. But uh, the workplace, you know, permissible exposure limits, you've got two legs of OSHA, which is compliance and um, compliance and consultation. That's who is, oversees the occupational setting. But I guarantee this will go into the courtroom at some point. Yeah. It may not be over OSHA versus DTSC, but this is going to be in the I'm courthouse. Sure yeah. We're looking at legal issues yep, absolutely. In the country as well. Uh, on behalf of Great. our students and, and faculty and, and friends, this is from Public Health. Thank you very much. Thank you so it's much. It's been a pleasure. I'm happy to come back anytime.